One of the intense pleasures of travel, as I'm sure many of you have discovered, is the opportunity to live amongst those who have not forgotten the old ways, who still feel the past in the wind, touch it in stones polished by rain, taste it in the bitter leaves of plants. And just to know that in the Amazon, jaguar shamans still journey beyond the Milky Way, or that in the high Arctic, the myths of the Inuit still resonate with meaning, or that in the Himalaya, the Buddhists still pursue the breath of the Dharma, is to remember the central revelation of anthropology, and that is the idea that the world into which you were born doesn't exist in some absolute sense, but is just one model of reality, the consequence of one particular set of adaptive choices that your cultural lineage made, however successfully many generations ago. But whether it is a voodoo acolyte in Haiti, a yak herder on the slopes of Shomalungma, an eagle hunter in central Kazakhstan, or a thunderhoof shaman in Mongolia, all of these peoples teach us that there are other ways of being, other ways of thinking, other ways of orienting yourself in social, spiritual, ecological space. And if you think about it, that's an idea that can only fill you with hope. Now, together, the myriad of cultures of the world make up a kind of social web of life that envelops the planet and is as important to the well-being of the planet as is a biological web of life that you know as a biosphere. And you could think of this cultural web of life as being an ethnosphere, and you could define the ethnosphere as being the sum total of all thoughts and ideas, myths and memories, in in intuitions and inspirations brought into being by the human spirit since the dawn of consciousness. The ethnosphere is humanity's great legacy. It's a symbol of all that we've achieved and the promise of all that we can achieve as a wildly creative species. And just as the biosphere has been severely eroded with the loss of habitat and the concomitant loss of plant and animal life, so too is the ethnosphere, but if anything, at a far greater rate. No biologist, for example, would dare suggest that 50% of all plants and animals are moribund. It simply is not the case. And yet that, the most apocalyptic scenario in the realm of biological diversity, scarcely approaches what we know to be the most optimistic scenario in the realm of cultural diversity. And the great indicator of that, of course, is language loss. When each of you were born, there were 7,000 languages spoken on Earth. Now, a language isn't just a body of vocabulary or a set of grammatical structures. A language is a flash to the human spirit. It's a vehicle through which the soul of each particular culture comes in a material world. I once wrote that every language is an old-growth forest of the mind, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of social and spiritual possibilities. And of those 7,000 languages spoken the day that you were born, by complete academic consensus amongst linguists, fully half aren't being whispered into the ears of infants. Now that means that literally we're living in a generation where half of humanity's social, spiritual, ecological knowledge is at risk. Now there are many people who say, wait a minute, wouldn't the world be a better place if we all spoke one language? Wouldn't communication be facilitated? Wouldn't it be easier to get along? And I, my answer to that is always say, what a brilliant idea, but let's make that universal language in Nuttatak. Let's make it Yoruba. Let's make it Tibetan. Let's make it Haida. Let's make it Quechua. And you begin to see, as a native speaker of English, what it would be like to be enveloped in silence, to have no means or ability to pass on the wisdom of your ancestry or to anticipate the promise of your descendants. And yet that dreadful fate is indeed the plight of someone somewhere on earth every fortnight. Because on average, every two weeks, some elder passes away and carries with him or her into the grave the last syllables of an ancient tongue. Now, the reason this is so particularly poignant is that it's happening in the very same generation in which the brilliance of genetics has finally proven it to be true, something that philosophers have always hoped to be true, and that is the fact that we're all brothers and sisters. And I don't mean that in the spirit of hippie ethnography. I mean, quite literally, studies of the human genome have left no doubt whatsoever that the genetic endowment of humanity is a continuum. Race has been exposed as an utter fiction. We are all cut from the same genetic cloth. Indeed, we're all descendants of that same handful of people who walked out of Africa some 65,000 years ago and then embarked on this extraordinary hegira a diaspora 40,000 years in duration, a mere 2,500 human generations that carried the human spirit to every corner of the habitable world. 
But here's the important point. If you accept that scientific truth that we're all cut from the same genetic cloth, it means by definition that every culture shares a basic same human genius, the same mental acuity, the same raw human potential. And critically, whether that genius is invested in the technological wizardry, which has been the great achievement of the West, or by contrast, placed into the challenge of unraveling the mystic threads of memory inherent in a myth, is simply a matter of choice and cultural orientation. There is no hierarchy in the affairs of culture. That old Victorian idea, so convenient in that age, that we somehow went from the savage to the barbarian to the civilized of the Strand of London, that somehow European society stood at the apex of a pyramid that slipped down to the so-called primitives of the world, has been absolutely destroyed by modern science, reduced to an artifact of the 19th century, no more relevant to our lives today than the idea that clergymen had in that distant century that the earth was but 6,000 years old. And this stunning affirmation of the human spirit, science has come to the fore to prove the truth of the central intuition of cultural anthropology. The whole idea that the other peoples of the world aren't failed attempts at being us. They're not failed attempts at being modern. Every culture is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the peoples of the world answer that question, they do so in the 7,000 different voices of humanity. And those voices and those answers collectively become our human repertoire for dealing with the challenges that will confront us as a species in the coming centuries. This is the central lesson of anthropology. Every culture has something to say. Each deserves to be heard, just as none has a monopoly on the route to the divine. In this sense, anthropology is the antidote to nativism. It is the antidote to Donald Trump. But the question is, what do we really do about it? You know, if you're a biologist and you identify an area of high species endemism, or if you're Sylvia Earle sitting at the... Hi, Sylvia. I'm so glad you could make it you know, and you find an incredible area of marine wealth, you try to create a protected area, but you can't make a rainforest park of the mind. You can't freeze cultures in time like some kind of zoological specimen. Change is the one constant of human affairs in all cultures through all time. Everybody is always dancing with new possibilities for life. So 15, almost 20 years ago, when I was approached by the National Geographic to be their social anthropologist, I was given the very direct mission of trying to change within a decade the way that the world viewed and valued culture. And it was a kind of daunting assignment because I knew that polemics were never persuasive, that politicians follow, they rarely lead. And yet I did have an intuition that storytellers could change the world. And since we were at the probably the most effective storytelling institution in the world, I argued that what we needed to do was set out on a series of journeys through the ethnosphere where we would take our enormous global audience to places where the cultural pr practices and beliefs were so transparently dazzling that you couldn't help but come away with a deeper and pure appreciation of the wonder of culture. So in the moments I have tonight with you, let me take you on some of those journeys to share some of those spaces. And I want to begin in the greatest culture sphere ever brought into being by the human imagination. Of course, that is Polynesia. Tens of thousands of islands flung like jewels upon a southern sea. And I was very fortunate to be invited by my good friend Nainoa Thompson to hail on the sacred vessel of Hawaii, Hokalea, with a Polynesian voyaging society. And these are young sailors who even today can name 250 stars in the night sky. These are sailors who can sense the presence of distant atolls of islands beyond the visible horizon simply by watching the reverberation of the waves in the hull of the vessel, knowing full well that every island group in the Pacific has its own unique refractive pattern that can be read with the same perspicacity with which a forensic scientist would read a fingerprint. These are sailors who in the darkness of the canoe can distinguish as many as five different sea swells moving through the vessel, distinguishing those caused by local weather disturbances from the deep currents that pulsate across the Pacific and be could follow with the same ease that a terrestrial explorer would follow a river to the sea. 
Indeed, if you took all of the genius that allowed us to put a man on the moon and applied it to an understanding of the ocean, what you would get is Polynesia. But the most extraordinary thing about this tradition of navigation was that it was all based on dead reckoning. And dead reckoning means that you only know where you are by remembering precisely how you got there. And it was the impossibility of using that methodology on long oceanic voyages that led most European transports to hug the shores of continents until the British solved the problem of longitude with the invention of the chronometer. But we know for a scientific fact that 10 centuries before Christ, from an ancient civilization called Lapita, the ancestors of the Polynesians set sail into the rising sun. In a thousand years, they reached Tonga, Samoa, and Fiji. And for reasons unknown, they stopped for 10 centuries. But then they sailed on, 4,000 kilometers across the ocean of Marquesas, northwest to Hawaii, southeast to Rapa Nui, Easter Island, and finally, around the time of the First Crusade, reaching the islands we now know as New Zealand, Eotearoa. And what this technique of navigation meant was that the wayfinder, sitting monk-like in the stern of the vessel, in a tradition that lacked the written word, had to remember every single sign of the sun, the moon, and the stars, the scent of the water, the shift of the winds. And if that n rhythm of knowledge, if that, and, and not just the knowledge itself, but the, 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 the timing with which the knowledge was acquired was broken, the voyage would end in disaster. And that's how the Pacific was settled by the greatest wayfinders the Earth has ever known. Now, if we move from the greatest ocean culture sphere into the greatest forest, we enter the homeland of the people of the Anaconda, the Amazon, a forest the size of the face of the full moon. And we find ourselves in the milk rivers of the Northwest Amazon, living amongst people who live so closely to that forest that cognitively they do not distinguish the color blue from the color green because the canopy of the heavens is equated to the canopy of the rainforest. And people who believe that mythologically they came up the milk river from the east in the belly of the sacred serpent only to be regurgitated on the affluence of the Northwest Amazon. Or if we go down the Cordillera into the homeland of the most extraordinary tribal group I lived with when I was young, the Warani, extraordinary because they were first peacefully contacted in 1958, five years after I was born. In 1957, five missionaries attempted contact and made a critical mistake. They dropped from the air eight by 10 glossy photographs and what we would say culturally were friendly gestures forgetting that the people of the rainforest had never seen anything two-dimensional in their lives. They picked up the photographs from the forest floor, looked behind the face to find the form to the figure, found nothing, and concluded that these were calling cards from the devil, and they promptly speared the five missionaries to death. But the Warani didn't just spear outsiders, they speared each other in these intertribal warfare. We traced eight generations and found two cases of natural death, and when we pressured the elders a little bit about it, they admitted that one of the fellows had gotten so old that he died getting old, so we speared him anyway. 54% uh, of their adult mortality was due to them spearing each other in these kind of Hatfield-McCoy-like tribal feuds. But they had a perspicacious knowledge of the forest that was extraordinary. Their hunters could smell animal urine at 40 paces and tell you what form of life it left, had left it behind. Not because they were sauvage in some kind of Rousseauian sense or bestial in some kind of uh, biological sense, but rather because they were true natural philosophers who had taken all of our human genius and applied it to an understanding of the forest homeland upon which their lives depended. And it was this knowledge that drew me as a young botanical explorer of the Amazon. I was extraordinarily fortunate to attend Harvard College and fall into the orbit of the greatest Amazon explorer of the 20th century, Richard Evans Schultes, the man who sparked the psychedelic era with the discovery of the magic mushrooms in Mexico in 1938. In 1941, he slipped away from Harvard into the Northwest Amazon, where he stayed for 13 uninterrupted years, living amongst unknown peoples, traveling unknown rivers, all the time enchanted by the wonder of the neotropical rainforest. But he was an odd choice to, beco to become a 60s icon because True, he saved William Burroughs' life when they discovered they were from the same class at Harvard. Uh, but he was so conservative that he didn't vote for the Republican Party. He professed not to believe in the American Revolution. He always voted for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. One of his colleagues said the only way for Schultes to go native would be to go to London. 
And I didn't know this when I knocked on the door at the age of 18, and I said, Professor, I'm from British Columbia. Well, that's all it took, the adjective British. And he thought I was talking about his beloved Columbia. I've saved up money in a logging camp, and I want to go to the Amazon and collect plants like you did. I knew nothing about the Amazon, nothing about botany. And this man who really was the equivalent of, of, of Spruce and Wallace and even Darwin simply looked across a mound of plant specimens who was antiquated by focals and said very simply, well, son, when do you want to go? And two weeks later, I was in the Amazon where I stayed for 15 months. And just before leaving, he said, always remember that the difference between a poison, medicine, hallucinogen, narcotic, is, is, is just dosage. And, and that was actually a pretty interesting answer. Because like this, for example, is a flying death. Karari, you've all heard of the arrow poisons, right? Well, the poison doesn't kill the prey. It's a powerful muscle relaxant. So the monkey struck by the dart dies by falling from the canopy, having lost muscular control. That alkaloid, when extracted in the 1940s at McGill University, yielded deep tubocararine, the muscle relaxant that revolutionized modern surgery. And this quest, this ethnopharmacological quest, led invariably into the realm of the shaman. Now, if you follow the work of these fantastic American anthropologists like Shirley MacLaine, uh, you would think that the shaman is some benign figure who sings a lot with feathers and so on. I've been with shaman all my life, and I've never been with one who wasn't psychotic. I mean, that's their job. They're the ones who swim in the mystic waters the rest of us would drown in. They're not physicians, let alone priests. They're more like nuclear engineers who go into the heart of the reactor to reprogram the world. That's the role of the shaman. And, and, and the shamanic art of healing is based on a, a notion that, of course, diseases are not caused by the presence of pathogens alone, but as a state of imbalance uh, where the spiritual and physical components of the individual do not find their pro proper equilibrium. And it's that imbalance that must be addressed. And that's why the essential act of healing is one in which the shaman man or woman must invoke some technique of ecstasy to soar away on the wings of trance to get into the distant metaphysical realms where he or she can work their deeds of magical, mystical, um, and, and, and metaphysical rescue. And that accounts for one of the most curious anomalies in botanical science. Of the, of the 120 known hallucinogenic plants, 95% are from the Americas. Not because the forests of equatorial West Africa or Southeast Asia were depauperate, but rather because people there had other avenues to the divine. But the route to the Godhead in the Americas has always been mediated by these curious plants, like in this old photograph that Schultes took in 1954 when he stumbled upon this curious powder, ebene, the semen of the sun, used by the Yanomami derived from the blood-red resin of several species in the genus Virola in the nutmeg family. These powders are chock full of powerful tryptamines, dimethyltryptamine, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine. To have this powder shot up your nose is like being shot out of a rifle barrel lined with the Baroque paintings and landing on a sea of electricity. It creates not the distortion of reality, it creates the disillusion of reality. I used to argue with Professor Schultes we shouldn't classify this as hallucinogenic because by the time you're under the influence, there's no one home anymore to experience the hallucinations. But the reason we're interested in these substances is not simply their dazzling pharmacological effects, but once again, what they tell us about another level of intuition, another way of knowing. You've all heard, of course, of ayahuasca, the vine of the soul, the vision vine. Well, ayahuasca is not a plant, it's a combination of plants. On the one hand, the leaves of a nondescript shrub in the coffee family, Cicotria viridis, full of these tryptamines. Now, incidentally, the reason the Yanomami blow those snuffs up the nose is that tryptamines are orally inactive because they're denatured by an enzyme found in the human gut, monoamine oxidase. They can only be taken orally if taken in conjunction with some other chemical that momentarily denatures the MAO in the human gut. Now, the woody liana has beta-carbolines in it, harmine and harmaline, which are indeed MAO inhibitors of the precise sort necessary to potentiate the tryptamines in the leaf. Now, none of you have to worry about that chemistry, but just think about this. How, in a flora of 90,000 species of vascular plants, did the indigenous people learn to combine these two morphologically distinct denizens of the rainforest in this powerful synergistic way? 
The only scientific explanation is trial and error, which statistically is immediately reduced to ridicule. If you ask the native people, they say the plants teach us. But what does that mean? When Schultes lived with the Siona Sequoia uh, in 1941, he identified 17 native vari folk varieties of this wooded liana, all of which were referable to his Harvard-trained taxonomic eye as being the same species. And yet the indigenous people could recognize and distinguish these varieties at great distances in the forest. And when he finally asked them the nature of their classification, he, they looked at him as if he were a fool, because any proper botanist would know that you took each one of the 17 on the night of a full moon, and each variety sang to you in a different key. Well, that's not going to get you a PhD at Oxford in plant systematics, but it's more interesting than counting flower parts. And it speaks about another way of knowing. And the reason this is so important is that we've just begun to understand the complexity of these societies, like the people of the Anaconda. The Warani are unique, endogenous, marrying amongst themselves in open warfare with their neighbors. That was not the pattern of the Amazon at the time of the great civilizations that Aureliana encountered in 1541 when he became the first European to go down the river. The question is haunted anthropologists, is there anywhere in the Amazon where the echoes of those ancient civilizations can still be heard? And the answer there is in the complex of peoples we call the people of the Anaconda, the Barasana, the Makuna, the Tanimukos, Tucanos, the Sana. These are societies that have wisdom traditions that favor knowledge as opposed to conflict. These are societies that have social structures that facilitate exchange and peace, not war, not the least of which is that you must marry someone who speaks a different language. And so in any one longhouse, you have six and seven languages spoken, but you never see a child practicing a distinct tongue. They simply wait, watch, listen, and one day begin to speak. These are societies that as we begin to deconstruct their rituals and their cosmologies, we realize that their mythologies amount to nothing more or less than complex land management plans that dictated exactly how people in great numbers could have lived in the upland forests of the Amazon. Now, all of this could have been lost. When I first lived with the Barasana in 1974, it felt like a place on the edge of cultural exhaustion. And then I returned 25 years later, and there was another world. And what happened in the intervening years is that a Colombian president, Virgilio Barco, said to a friend of mine, Martin von Hildebrand, do something for the Indians. And in five incredible years in Colombia as head of Indian Affairs, Martin did more than something. He secured legal land tenure for an area of land the size of the United Kingdom for the 57 ethnicities of the Northwest Amazon. And behind a veil of isolation created by the troubles of modern Colombia, given their land, a whole new dream of culture was reborn. Halfway through making this film where we took ayahuasca for three days and three nights to celebrate cassava woman and, and the fertility rites, um, Mark, uh, Stephen uh, Hugh Jones, the head of anthropology at Cambridge, flew in to join us. In the late 60s, he had predicted the demise of the Barasana, their disappearance, and he couldn't believe what he saw. 250 men in full ritual regalia, taking ayahuasca, dancing, becoming not metaphors of the ancestors, literally becoming the ancestors, and traveling back in space and time, visiting as they literally chant 1,800 place names of the ancient route of migration that brought them up the Milk River, places that we know geographically still exist. They have never seen. They've just had them in their imaginations for generations. And he saw this. He went out to the satellite phone and he called his beloved wife in Oxford, or in Cambridge, rather, and he said, Christina, you won't believe my fucking eyes. The only thing that disappeared were the fucking missionaries. And this is a good example of the cultures are not on a one-way slope downward. And we interviewed some of the elders, and we said, why did you let these missionaries say what they said about your culture? And they said, because they promised to make us human. And of course, that's the essence of colonization, is to persuade the colonized of their own inherent inferiority. All of this could have been lost if it hadn't been for that political action. Now, if we slip from the Amazon into the Andes, we can begin to explore what I call sacred geography. And again, I'm not invoking hippie ethnography. I mean, what does it really mean to live in a world where you believe that a mountain's a deity? You know, I was raised in the forests of British Columbia to believe those forests existed to be cut. That was the foundation of the ideology of scientific forestry that I 
learned in school and I practiced as a logger in the woods. That made me profoundly different than my friends amongst the Kwakwakwak who believed that those same forests were the abode of Hukuk and the crooked beak of heaven and the cannibal spirits of the north end of the world. Now, the interesting thing isn't who's right and who's wrong. Is the forest cellulose and board feet? Is it the domain of the spirits? It's how the belief system mediates the relationship in a metaphorical way with a profoundly different consequence for the ecological footprint of a society. We, again, we think of ourselves as being the exceptional. We think of ourselves as being special. We think of cultural myopia as the curse of humanity and always has been. And we forget that we are not exceptional. We are exceptional in the sense that the way we think is anomalous, but the way we think can be traced directly in our lineage. You know, when we tried to liberate ourselves in the West from the tyranny of absolute faith, when Descartes declared that all that existed was mind and material, in a single gesture he deanimated the world. And the idea that the flight of a hawk could have meaning was ridiculed. But of course, in dismissing ideas of myth, magical mysticism, he also dismissed metaphor to the point, as Saul Bellow said, science would make a house cleaning of belief. And eventually, you know, the, the triumph of secular materialism became the conceit of modernity. But we are anomalous in the ethnographic record in viewing the earth as being inert. Most societies, and certainly throughout the Andes, have a very dynamic sense, and they have obligations to the earth, and everything is based on reciprocity. Human beings owe it to the earth, but the earth owes it to human beings. And that is constantly played out in ritual. My godchildren are raised in a, a valley where every mountain is an Apu deity that will direct their destiny. Uh, and this is played out in, in fantastic ways, like in the, I don't know if any, many of you have been to Cusco. I'm sure many of you have been to Cusco. Have you been to Chinchero? It's a very traditional community. And once each year in Sincero, a fantastic thing happens. The fastest young boy in every hamlet is given the honor of becoming a woman. And for one day, he puts on the traje of his mother or his sister, and he has to lead all able-bodied men on a run of the community lands. But it's not your ordinary run. It starts out at 11,000... It starts out at 11,500 feet. You run 2,000 feet down to the base of the sacred mountain Antikilika, and then you run to 16,000 feet. Over the sacred valley, you descend in the sacred valley and cross two more soaring Andean ridges over the course of a long day. And the metaphor is so beautiful. You go into the mountain as an individual, but through sacrifice and exhaustion, and remember that sacrifice in Latin means to make sacred, you fuse as one single community, one single human pulse that has reaffirmed your sense of belonging and your reciprocal obligations to the world. And at the age of 48, in what my wife calls one of my many midlife crises, I became the first outsider and the oldest man ever to run the movimiento, and I only got through those 24 hours by chewing more coca leaves than anyone in the 4,000 year history of the plant. But what really got me through is that for 30 years I had baptized godchildren and I'd raised all these kids and bought cows and pencils, put them through school. And when all my ahalos found that their padrino was stupid enough to run the movimiento at age 48, they came out and they clung to me like limpets. They weren't going to let anything happen to their cash cow. Now, these localized rituals become panandine in these great events like the Koyeriti, when the Pleiades emerge in the sky. Tens of thousands of indigenous people converge on the sacred valley of the Sinicara in the shadow of Ausangati, the most sacred mountain of the Inca. And here you have a perfect expression of 500 years of Catholic faith on top of pre-Columbian intuitions. The crosses are carried from the communities on the backs of pilgrims, high up into the mountains, in the shadow of Ausangati, to be planted in the glaciers for 48 hours to absorb the power of Pachamama and then carried back down the following day to reinvigorate the communities for the coming year. Now, if that's an example of kind of this syncretic reality that is the Pan-Andean culture today, there is one place in South America where the pre-Columbian voice is heard unfettered. And that is in this extraordinary volcanic massif, the highest coastal mountain range on Earth, the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, that soars out of the Caribbean coastal plain of Colombia. In the wake of the conquest, the Tayrona, which were a civilization that carpeted that Caribbean coastal plain, their survivors retreated into this massif and reinvented their culture into one a, a devotional society of peace. To this day, 
in a blood-stained continent, they were never fully conquered by the Spanish. And indeed, they remain ruled by a ritual priesthood, but the training for the priesthood is rather extraordinary. As reported by the great Colombian anthropologist Reichel Domatov in the 1940s, the young acolytes were taken away from their families at the age of three, put into a shadowy world of darkness for 18 years, where they're enculturated in the values of their society, which include the idea that their prayers and rituals literally maintain the cosmic balance of the world. And then after that incredible initiation, the lad who has never seen a sunrise, never seen a horizon, is taken out of the temple and taken on a journey to the heart of the world. To see the beauty of the earth, even as a priest who has trained them, essentially says, you see, it's as I've told you all these years, it's yours to protect. Now that was almost too good to be true, isn't it? Uh, and it was almost like an anthropological fable because Reichel never actually saw initiation. He never saw a journey to the heart of the world. But when I first read his papers when I was a kid, I wanted, I wanted, to, I wanted to go there. And something magical happened. M M Carolina Barco, the Colombian ambassador, came into my office with a delegation led by this young man, Danilo Villafania, and three mamos, one from the Wiwa, one from the Arawakos, and one from the Kogi. And they were pitching me on an idea. Um, they, the Kogi had had a film made with the BBC in which the BBC people had said they were the real spiritual ones of the mountains, which really pissed off the Arawakos. So they came to the National Geographic. They wanted their film. And as they were pitching me, it was kind of an odd situation, I looked at this young man. I said, look, I don't mean to be rude, but you look an awful lot like an old friend of mine. And I pulled out a photograph of his father that I had taken in 1974, his father who was later murdered by the paramilitaries. And I said, Danilo, you may not remember, but when you were a baby, I carried you on my back for weeks in the mountains with your father, Adalberto. He began to weep. And that connection just sealed our friendship to this day. And he instantly said to me, why don't you come and we will do a journey to the heart of the world, which is what we did. And we discovered that today, the acolytes don't spend 19, 18 years in the darkness, but they do spend all of their youth in the environs of the sacred temple, much of the time at night learning the complex re religiosity of the people. And then indeed they do embark on a journey to the heart of the world where every ripple in the landscape resonates with mythological significance. Even the hats worn by the Arawako are a conscious attempt to mimic the snow fields across the Madre Creadora, Saranqua, the earth goddess. And we were on this pilgrimage, and we reached the penultimate stage of the pilgrimage. And the metaphor in this set of cultures is the loom. They say, upon this loom I weave my life. When they move up and down the mountains, exploiting various ecological niches, they refer to their movements as threads, so that over the course of a lifetime, a woman or a man weaves a cloak over the body of the goddess. When they plant a garden, the women plant it like this, the men plant it like this, so if you turn it off, you have a piece of cloth. And, we've, we, and, and, and thoughts like prayers are threads. So when the mamos get in a circle, if you see them doing this, it's because they're praying. And I saw a circle of men praying. I knew something was up. And what had happened is a FARC had come down to kidnap us. And we mercifully were six hours late getting to this high hamlet. And the FARC had just gone over the rise. And so we had to hide out till dark. And you don't really have a dramatic escape on a mule. You kind of clip-clop your way to rescue. But we did. We ran into a firefight. But we were able to just hand our cameras to the Wiwa colleagues who finished that section of the film. And we came back to the sea, where even though the sacred sites are dominated in places by modern architecture, it does not keep the elder brother from doing what they have always done, making pilgrimages from the sea to the ice and from the ice back to the sea, uh, even as they pray every day for our collective well-being. It's humbling to think that two hours from Miami Beach, this complex of pre-Columbian civilizations are still there doing what they have always done. They speak in full paragraphs about our need to change our way, and they speak with great articulation as to the folly of the younger brother and the need of all of us to follow a more spiritual path. Well, I've always worked by the adage of Picasso, who said that if it works, it's obsolete. And after four years of traveling in the remote reaches of the Northwest Amazon and down the Andean Cordillera, uh, studying for the most part coca, 
the botanical source of cocaine, a plant known to the Incas, the divine leaf of immortality. I was, I was looking for a change, and there was always something looming in the fourth floor eerie of Professor Schulte's. And in early 1982, on a miserable Boston winter day, he summoned me to his office and asked me if I was interested in going down to the Caribbean island nation of Haiti, infiltrating the secret societies and securing the formula of a folk poison used to make zombies. Well, I said, yes, you know, uh, having no idea that what I thought was a lark would end up consuming four years of my life. Because within hours of arriving in the Afro-Caribbean reality, something was made available to me that had eluded me in all those years in the Amazon, and that was a window truly wide open to the mystic. You know, it's interesting. Where do we get this idea of voodoo being evil? Voodoo is simply a fond word from Dahomey that means spirit or God. Voodoo is not a black magic cult. It's a complex metaphysical worldview. If I were to ask you to name the great religions of the world, what continent is always left out? Sub-Saharan Africa, the tacit assumption being that those great kingdoms and civilizations had no religion. Well, of course they did, and voodoo is simply this powerful distillation of belief in which the individual is able to summon through music and chant and dance the spirits from beneath the great waters so that the soul of the individual is momentarily displaced by the spirit of the god, allowing the human being to become the god, which is why Africans always say, you white people go to church and speak about god, we dance in the temple and become god. And indeed, Afri African uh, um, religious practitioners move in and out of the spirit realm with an ease and impunity that has always astonished the ethnographic observer. And just in the way that you would speak of a Judeo Christian society or, or Buddhist society, you can speak of a Gene society or a Voodoo society in which you find completeness. Now when someone is taken by the spirit, they are the God and they can't be harmed. And that's why you see these theatrical gestures here in Togo before a fetish symbol of the divine, a, a lad cutting into his cheek, his hands, his shoulders, but, or even more profoundly here in Haiti, voodoo acolytes in a state of trance, handling burning embers with absolute impunity, an astonishing example of the mind's ability to affect the body that bears it when catalyzed in a state of extreme excitation. Where did we get this idea of voodoo being evil? You ever thought about that? Well, in part because Haiti was the only independent black nation on earth for 100 years, the only successful slave revolt in history. They funded Simon Bolivar on the condition he freed the slaves in Grand Colombia. They bought shipments of slaves destined for the American South and gave them freedom. They were a thorn in the side of an imperial age, and in the 1920s, the U.S. Marine Corps occupied Haiti. And everybody above the rank had, of sergeant had a book contract. The books had names like Cannibal Cousins, Black, Black Baghdad, Voodoo Fire in Haiti, A Puritan in Voodoo Land, The White King of Lago Nav, The Magic Island. There were scores of these books filled with children bred for the cauldron, pins and needles and voodoo dolls that don't even exist, and of course zombies crawling out of the grave to attack people. These books gave rise to the RKO movies of the 1940s, Night of the Living Dead, Zombies on Broadway, The Right Zombie Slave, and they essentially said during the era of Jim Crow, when most of those Marines were from the American South, that any country where such abominations occurred could only find its redemption in military occupation. And that's why we have pilloried this most democratic and essential spiritual aspiration of humanity from the ancient continent of Africa. Zombies, I'm not going to go into it, but zombies do exist. I found the poison. Uh, it's a very powerful neurotoxin uh, that, that uh, about, uh, about 160,000 times stronger than cocaine as an anesthetic, 1,000 times more toxic than sodium cyanide, a uh, lethal dose would balance the head of a pin. But it turns out that zombification is a form of social sanction invoked by the secret societies that are the most powerful arbiter of social and political life in Haiti. The secret societies it was a well that Francois Duvalier went to to create the Tonton Macoud. I can, I can share some of that story over, over a beer maybe. But um, two, two things came out of that. Uh, one was an amusing episode of coming back to U.S. Customs with the zombie poison on Easter Sunday of 1982. I had no permits, and I had a suitcase made of surplus 7-up tin cans printed in Saudi Arabia 
that had become a suitcase in the Port-au-Prince Central Market. The suitcase was crammed full of all the ingredients, human remains, dried fish, dried toads, uh, dried uh, snakes, uh, plants. I had a live bufo marinus toad in my backpack, the biggest toad in the world. And I went up to this customs guy. I had no permits. And I just thought, well, I opened it. He slammed it shut. And I swear, this is quoting your US customs agent. He slammed it shut. And he says, look, remember, this is New York, JFK. Look, it's Easter fucking Sunday. I didn't even want to fucking work today. I don't know who the fuck you are. Just get the fuck out of here. And that's how the zombie poison came into America. And I can tell you that people always said, well, you know, I was warned, you know, these secret societies were so feared that when I wrote an NSF proposal, it came back that said, if Davis is funded, he will be killed. That was, the, and the only time I ever had a problem was one night, the only way I got out of it was by lighting myself on fire. But that's another story. It's quite dramatic. Uh, but the point is that, that, that zombification is one dark thread woven through the fabric of a very complex, multi-layered, benign, and wondrous worldview. So we have this idea that you know these cultures, quaint and colorful, are somehow destined to fade away as if by natural laws, if they're failed attempts at being modern, failed attempts at keeping up. Nothing could be further from the truth. Technology is no threat to culture, all, nor is change a threat to culture. What is a threat to culture is power, the crude face of domination. We have this idea that these societies are fragile. On the contrary, in every case are living dynamic peoples being driven out of existence, not fading away, driven out of existence by identifiable forces. And that's actually an optimistic observation because if human beings are the agents of cultural destruction, we can be the facilitators of cultural survival. Now, I, I wrote a book about my misadventures in Haiti, The Serpent and the Rainbow, that was made into the worst Hollywood movie in history. And Hemingway said that if you sell a book to Hollywood, you should start off in Arizona, drive to the California state line, throw the book over, and then go back to Tucson and have a drink. I didn't do that. I disappeared in the forests of Borneo. I wanted to live in a place wet with the innocence of birth. I wanted to live with the nomadic people of the rainforest. And the Penan were the last nomadic society. And nomadic societies are fascinating because after all, until the Neolithic Revolution, where as Joseph Campbell said, the poetry of the shaman became the prose of the priesthood, we succumbed to the cult of the seed, all human beings were wanderers on a pristine planet. And nomadic societies are profoundly different. How, for example, do you measure wealth in a culture where there's a disincentive to accumulate anything? Well, in this society, wealth is defined as a strength of social relations between people. Because if those relations fray, everybody suffers. There is no word for thank you in the Penan language because everything is reflexively shared. I once gave a cigarette to a little old Penan woman and watched as she tore it apart to distribute the individual strands of tobacco equitably to every hut in the encampment, rendering the item useless, honoring her obligation to share. And in these societies, which have no written word, the entire knowledge is encoded in the vocabulary and the memory of the best storyteller. And in all the non-written or, or oral societies that I've ever been with, from the high Arctic and, and to the Penan, throughout the Amazon, there seems to be a kind of a dialogue with the natural world, such that the flight of a hornbill becomes a kind of curse of script of nature, like a vocabulary written on the wind. But by the time I reached Borneo in 1986, the sounds of the forest had become the sounds of the machinery. You know, we heard so much about deforestation of the Amazon in the 1980s. Brazil in 1985 produced 1.3% of the tropical log exports. Malaysia produced 45%, much of it from the homeland of the Penan. And so in a single generation, a homeland was transformed. Rivers that once ran clear became so laden with silt that it seemed as if half of Borneo was slipping away to the South China Sea where the empty freighters hung on the horizon. Women forced into prostitution and servitude. Children suffering from ailments never known in the forest. Men humiliated on a daily basis, eventually rebelling, rising up, blowpipes against bulldozers, no match for the power of the Malaysian state. And so within a single generation, I saw a civilization with an extraordinary knowledge of the forest, morally inspired, inherently right, literally crushed along with the forest homeland that had given them birth. Now, as I 
mentioned earlier in terms of thinking about how we treat the natural world, going right back to the materialism of Descartes, we think of our way as the norm. I can't stress how much it is the exception. And to go to the opposite extreme, let's slip for a moment into one of the most extraordinary civilizations, that of the Aboriginal people of Australia. We know from the Y chromosome that the ancestors of the Aborigines were the first people to walk out of Africa. In 5,000 years, they crossed the underbelly of Asia, traversed the water that even then separated New Guinea from the most parsimonious continent on Earth, and then they went walking. And they created 10,000 clan territories, all linked together by a single idea, and that was a dreaming. And the dreaming wasn't a dream, it was something altogether different. It was the idea that the world both existed and yet was eternally waiting to be born. Now, when the British arrived in Australia, they saw a people that looked strange, had a simple material technology, but what really offended the British is that the Aborigines had no interest in improving upon their material lot. And because progress, optimism, moving forward was the very ethos of Victorian Europe during the settlement period of Australia, notions of optimism that, by the way, would die in the mud and blood of Flanders of the Great War, the British were offended by the Aborigines, and they concluded in their inimitable way that they weren't human at all, and they began to shoot them. As recently as 1902, it was debated in Parliament in Melbourne as to whether or not Aborigines were human or not. As recently as the 1950s, ranchers in Australia had quotas as to how many abos could have been shot with impunity who trespassed upon their land. As recently as the 1960s, a school book used in schools across Australia, a treasury of fauna of Australia, listed the Aboriginal people as amongst the interesting forms of wildlife in the continent. And what was missing was the inability of the settlers to understand this subtle devotional philosophy. The reason the Aborigines had no interest in, improve, in improving upon their material lot is because they had no interest in improving upon their material lot. The whole civilization was the antithesis of progress and change, it was a society profoundly conservative, it was a society of stasis. The entire purpose of life was to do nothing but the ritual gestures along the song lines, and the song lines were the trajectories sung, uh, walked by the ancestors who sang the universe into existence in the time of the rainbow serpent. These song lines traversed the entire continent like a, a maze of spiritual, of, 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 uh, of cloth. And the whole purpose of life wasn't to change anything. It was to do the ritual gestures deemed to be necessary to keep the world exactly as it was at the time of its creation. It would be like all Western science was invested into pruning the shrubs in the Garden of Eden to keep that garden just as it was when Adam and Eve had their fateful conversation. Now, the interesting thing, again, is not to say who's right and who's wrong. You know, if we had followed this intellectual trajectory, of, uh, we would not have put a man on the moon. But on the other hand, we wouldn't be talking about global climate change and our capacity to transform the biophysical foundations of existence on planet Earth. Now, if industrial, egregious industrial intrusions and policies are one serious threat to the ethnosphere, perhaps the most pernicious is ideology, be it the ubiquitous cult of the modern or the madness of materialism emanating from the Marxist philosophy of Beijing. This is a photograph of a Buddhist nun that I took at Angkor Wat many years ago. Her hands and feet have been severed from her body for the crime of pursuing her religious faith during the era of Pol Pot. And if we move into the mountains of Tibet, where I spend a great deal of time, we'll come to understand what it meant when Mao Zedong, the man with the dubious distinction of being responsible for the death and murder of more of his own people than Hitler and Stalin put together. When he said to a young Dalai Lama that all religion was poisoned, his holiness knew what to expect. And when the jackboot of the Red Guard finally crushed Lhasa in 1940, uh, 1959, uh, 1.2 million Tibetans would be murdered for their religious faith. 6,000 um, ancient temples and monasteries were reduced to riprap and dust. And what was it about the Buddhist Dharma that so threatened the Marxist materialists of Beijing? Well, it's all distilled, as you know, in the Four Noble Truths. All life is suffering. By that, the Buddha didn't mean that all life was negation. He meant that shit happens. 
The second of the noble truths was the cause of suffering was ignorance. By that the Buddha didn't mean stupidity. He meant the tendency of human beings to cling to the cruel illusion of our own centrality in the stream of divine existence. The third of the noble truths was simply the revelation that ignorance could be overcome. And the fourth and most consequential was the delineation of a spiritual practice that not only had the possibility of a transformation of the human heart, but had 2,500 years of empirical evidence that that practice, if followed, would achieve a transformation of the human heart. And it was that that drew me into the mountains of the Himalaya some years ago on a kind of a, a journey to the heart to really look not for the Western heroes that climbed Everest and found themselves in a zone of death, touching cold rock in, at an elevation where oxygen deprivation alone obliterated consciousness, which from the Buddhist point of view is just about the stupidest thing you can do with a precious incarnation. We went in search of a true wisdom hero. We had heard about this extraordinary woman and my companion was Matthew Ricard. Some of you may know Matthew's work. He's a translator of the Dalai Lama. Matthew came from an illustrious Parisian family. His father was Francis' most accomplished Descartian philosopher. Mother was a well-known painter. If you can believe it, Matthew learned piano from Stravinsky, photography from Henri Cartier-Bresson, anthropology at the feet of Claude Lévi-Strauss. He himself was studying molecular biology in the lab of a Nobel laureate at the Pasteur Institute. One day, one day he woke up and he realized there was no correlation between fame, wealth, and happiness. So he went back to where he had always been happy and became ordained as a Tibetan monk. And you can see from this photograph that to spend two months on the trails of the Himalaya with Mathieu was like being in Sherwood Forest with Friar Tuck. Also with us was Shara Barma, traditional Amshi Tibetan doctor, seen here quizzically examining my urine sample. And, and he was treating a remarkable woman, and this is a story. She was beautiful. She was forced to betroth herself in marriage to a wealthy merchant when she wanted a spiritual life. To escape that man's clutches, she crawled down a human latrine, covered with excrement, escaped and found herself at the doorway to the Temboche Monastery in Solukumbu. The monks, the lamas, cleaned her up, dispatched her over the 19,000-foot Nangpala Pass into Tibet, where she became ordained as a Tibetan nun. She came back over the mountains and became what they call a Sasampa Ani, a lifelong retreatant. She entered a cell where she had stayed for 45 years, not seeing the light of the sun on her face, with attendants bringing her food twice a day, removing her waste, and all the time devoting herself to the recitation of a single mantra. And because she was old, we had an opportunity to go with Mathieu and, and uh, Cherub to meet her. And our journey began at the uh, monastery of Tupton Sholing um, under Tr the late revered Tulsa Rinpoche, the head of the Nyingma tradition. And during the ceremony celebrating, the monastery kind of clings like a swallow's nest to the edge of the mountains of Solo Kubmu. And, and, and the ceremony was Mani Rumdu, the 18-day commemoration of the transmission of the Dharma to Tibet during the 8th century. And then we began this journey of the heart, higher and higher into the mountains, uh, past the cave where Sherab, as part of his seven years of medical training, spent one full year in solitary retreat. And with Mathieu every night chanting the sutras, we came closer and closer to this remote nunnery. And this next photograph is a photograph I took. The instant sunlight fell on this woman's face for the first time in 45 years. And by the terms of reference of our society, the face that greeted us should have been mad. But instead, the face literally radiated loving compassion. She began immediately to give away all merit for her uh, austerities to all sentient beings. She immediately began to take Mathieu to task for the unnecessarily baroque rituals practiced in the male-dominated monasteries of the region. And later, Mathieu said to me, you see, this is proof of the efficacy of the science of the mind that is Tibetan Buddhism. It's not about the twiddling of thumbs. The very proof of the efficacy is the serenity achieved by the practitioner. And later that evening at a distant monastery, a lama took me aside and said, you know, we in Tibet don't believe that you went to the moon, but you did. You may not believe that we achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, but we do. And so today the Tibetans, still suffering under the jackboot, 
of the Chinese chart their future on the inspiration of the Diamond Sutra, which maintains that life is like that candle in the wind, the dawn fading into the morning, the effervescent nature of life itself. And they leave it to us to ask why we tolerate the wrath of China, which continues to do so much to destroy the civilization that has given so much to the world. So in the end, we really have to ask ourselves, you know, what kind of world do we want to live in? This isn't a gesture of nostalgia or romanticism. It's how are we going to move forward? The idea is not to have anyone go to a pre-industrial past or anyone be kept from the genius of modernity. How do we find a way that all peoples can benefit from the genius of modernity, but critically without that engagement demanding the death of who they are as a people? Because... If there's one lesson of anthropology, it's that culture is not trivial. Culture is not decorative. It's not the clothes we wear, the prayers we utter, the songs we sing. Culture is ultimately about a body of moral and ethical values that every civilization places around each individual human being to keep at bay the barbaric heart that history teaches us lies within all of us. It is culture that allows us to make sense out of sensation, find order and meaning in the universe, to do what Lincoln said, always look for the better angels of our nature. And if you want to know what happens when the constraints of culture are lost, when individuals by coercion or through volition turn their backs on the past, often aspiring to a level of affluence that will always remain beyond their reach, falling back to the lowest rung of an economic ladder that goes nowhere into a sea of disaffection and alienation, you simply have to look at the points of conflict and chaos around the world. The genocide museum in Kigali. Every major conflict in the world today is a clash of beliefs and culture and aspirations and expectations. Fortunately, nation states are finally waking up to the fact that the Native, the having diversity within their ranks is not an issue of shame, but a, a tremendous strength. You know, I, I'm from Canada, and when the British first reached the Arctic, they took the Inuit to be savages. The Inuit took the British to be gods. Both were wrong. What the British failed to understand is that there's no better sign of genius than the ability to survive in a harsh Arctic environment where there is no wood and everything has to be forged from the cold. The Inuit didn't fear the cold, they took advantage of it. The runners of their sleds were made of fish, Arctic char, laid in a row and wrapped in the hide of a caribou skin. Fr uh, Peter Freuchen used to always say that the great thing about an Inuk sled is that if you ran out of food, you could eat your sled. I recorded when I was Oh, here's a photograph. And by the way, it's interesting that modern anthropology was born in Baffin Island when Franz Boas found himself, as I did, one night alone out on the ice. We were polar bear hunting. That night, the temperature dropped to minus 65, and that's when the skidoo broke down. And they simply made an igloo. We got out the robes. We got the oil lamps and we had raw meat. And despite what Greenpeace says, blood on ice in the Arctic is not a sign of death, it's an affirmation of life itself. And when I was once Norwell hunting at the tip of Baffin Island, I recorded this great story from Olayek. His wife, Martha, just passed away. During the 1950s, a dark period of Canadian history, we forced the Inuit in the settlement to establish our sovereignty in an archipelago that could have gone back to the Europeans. The, this hunting group, fearful for the life of an old man who refused to go along, took away the grandfather's weapons, tools, thinking that it would force him to join the family group in the move to the settlement, but it didn't. In an arctic night, black as night, he slipped outside of the igloo, pulled down his caribou hide trousers, and defecated into his hand. And as the feces began to freeze, he shaped it in the form of an implement. And when the implement, forged by the cold from human waste, took final shape, he put a spray of saliva along the leading edge, and with what the Inuit call a shit knife, he killed a dog. He skinned the dog, improvised the traces of a sled with the skin of the dead dog, a sled with the ribcage of the dead dog, and then shit knife and belt, harnessed up an adjacent living dog, and slipped away into the Arctic night. Now talk about getting by with nothing. And it's a rather extraordinary metaphor for the resilience of 
Inuit people, a resilience that's been sorely tested now, of course, by something beyond their control, which is the changing of the climate. This is a photograph I took in the northernmost community in the world, Kanak in northwest Greenland, where the ice used to come in in September and stay till July. Now it comes in November and is gone by March. In their language, the word sila means both weather and consciousness. So the shifting weather is also a direct assault on their entire spiritual worldview. And this is the plight of the Inuit people today. I want to close just with a more hopeful story. Um, in the immediate wake of 9-11, I wanted to do a beautiful story about Islam. So I traveled to the great bend of the Niger River and north to the great port on the Sea of Sand of the Western Sahara, Timbuktu. And of course, those of you who know Timbuktu know that at a time when Paris and London were mud hovels, Timbuktu had 25,000 university students. It rivaled Damascus and Baghdad and Cairo as great centers of Islamic learning. And indeed, the entire knowledge of the ancient Greeks would not have reached Europe to inform the Renaissance had it not been kept in a repository amongst the great scholars of the Islamic faith. And even today in Timbuktu, you can see and hold in your hand these extraordinary manuscripts from the 13th and 10th centuries, astronomy, cosmology, biology, chemistry, it's extraordinary. And then heading north, we went to an ancient salt mine called Taudeni, where the salt wasn't a condiment, it was a sacred essence of the desert. It was traded an ounce for ounce with gold from the Gold Coast of Africa. And of course, before the discovery of the New World, two-thirds of Europe's gold came from West Africa overland across the Sahara to Marrakesh, and that was the route that we followed, a thousand miles north of Timbuktu to Taudeni. You cannot marry if you're a Berber or Tamachek until you have completed that journey to the mine, which is said to hone the senses. And as we got to the mine, we had this entourage, it was during the Torg Rebellion. I don't even know who all these people were. We kept picking them up, but it was so beautiful. Five times a day we would stop and in the dearth of water they would rub their skin with the salt of the sand of the desert to cleanse themselves before prayer. The mine itself was an absolute biblical scene. My friend Isu Muhammad, this massive Torg, took one look and he said, I would not bring my wife here. And I asked some of the smugglers what country they were from. They said, there are no countries here. And two events happened that were very dramatic in those few days we were actually at the mine. First of all, I met this man who chronologically was younger than me, but his body was broken. He was trapped in debt peonage. He had tried to save the life of his child, incurred a debt from which he could never escape. By calculating the productivity of himself in the pits of the mine and his age, the price of salt, I realized this man was never going to escape his debt, and yet his debt was less than a dinner for two in London. And so I gave him the money. And he blessed Allah. And I never found out whether he used it to get home to his family. Was he telling me the truth? Did he get killed in the mine for the money? Because as soon as the, the transaction was complete and he blessed Allah, a sandstorm swept through the desert. He simply disappeared in a haze of yellow sand-fused air. Two days later, as we made our way south, we came upon a caravan that we encountered going north. A strange rainstorm had cracked open the Sahara sky. If the salt gets wet, it loses all value when it cracks. And so this entire caravan had been forced to stop in the desert. They were 250 miles from the nearest well. They had just sent off this one lad, this is a photograph I took just when we came upon them, to walk 25 miles where they thought there was a depression they might be able to dig for water. They were down to one liter of water. Now remember that you can live for two weeks without food in the Sahara. Death from dehydration comes overnight. In fact, there's a saying amongst the smugglers that the great thing about brake fluid is it keeps you off the battery acid. What did they do with their last liter of water? They immediately kindled a fire to brew us tea. Honoring the Bedouin adage that you will kill the last goat that gives the milk that keeps your children alive to feed a needy wandering stranger who comes into your tent because you never know when you will be that stranger, cold, hungry, in need of rescue. And as I watched Muhammad pour me that first cup of tea from his last liter of water, 
I thought to myself, this is why I've done this work for 50 years. Because these are the moments, these encounters, that leave us all filled with the possibility of hope. Thanks very much.